Boston and Paris now share some sad common ground. Both cities have suffered terror attacks carried out by Islamic extremists, but the similarities don't end there. The accused in the Boston Marathon bombing and the suspects in the assault on the offices of Charlie Hebdo are a pair of brothers. In both instances, the suspects escaped, a manhunt ensued, and in the chaotic aftermath, a police officer was shot and killed at point-blank range, although it's unclear at this point whether the French murder is linked to the attack. Of course, there are a number of distinctions between the two attacks as well. In Boston, a weapon of mass destruction was det detonated, killing and injuring victims at random. The Paris attackers wielded guns and had specific targets in mind. Joining me now to discuss the convergence and divergence of these two events is my colleague Marco Werman, host of the WGBH program, The World. Marco, thanks for being here. Yeah, you bet, Adam. So you have sort of a personal tie to both these events, right? You yeah. have lived in Paris over the years some? Right. On and off over the years, I know Paris pretty well. Uh, I can go there and not get lost. Uh, interestingly, whenever I go to Paris, one of the first things I do before leaving Charles de Gaulle Airport is buy a copy of uh, Charlie Hebdo. I read that piece you wrote yeah. for, for the world. Yeah, and just briefly, why do you why do you go for it every time you visit Paris? Because there's nothing like it in the United States. Uh, as I wrote, there was National Lampoon in the 70s. It kind of came close, but r really there's nothing like it. It's, it's as many people compared it to, Mad Magazine, but even more body. So, it, you know, for me, it, it kind of, uh, it satisfies two, uh, you know, entertaining needs of mine. Uh, one is, you know, puerile, uh, juvenile <laughs> humor, uh, boy humor, but also politics and a yeah. really interesting take on all kind of politics. So a regular visitor to Paris, regular Charlie Hebdo reader, and you live in Cambridge. In Cambridge and I Port. live in Cambridge. So I, you know, I was around last year, uh, uh, it was around in 2013, of course, during the Boston Marathon and, you know, just r remarkable how many of all these little spots that I know in Boston kind of echo some of the things that I know about this case in, in Paris. And right, so just, to, yeah. yeah, go ahead, to your mind, what are the big similarities between these two events? Well, and I'm not sure what this actually says when we line up the similarities, but th they are kind of eerie. So as you said, we've got two brothers, uh, the best as we understand right now with the Paris right. story, uh, two brothers. Uh, we've got policemen killed, uh, one policeman here in Boston, several in Paris, but one, interestingly, at point blank range. So that's really tragic as well. There's an escape by car. There's a, a gas station that is now figuring in as a point of interest. And of course, this massive manhunt. And you know, even last night, it, it was a kind of premature alert that in the city of Reims, there was, they were surrounding a house. It felt like Watertown part two. Um, so, you know, when I go into Cambridge, I, I see those gas stations on River Street, you know, and it's like, you know, all over again. But it's, uh, I, you know, I, I, I'm not sure how constructive it is to kind of look at, at what all that means, because it, perhaps it's not that surprising. I mean, if you are going to attack a newspaper like this and you're extremists, you need collaborators. So the guy found his brother. Uh, you've got to, for, you know, fend off the people who are going to stop you. So they're going to kill policemen. You escape by car, you're going to need yeah. gas. So I think that's, you know, but it, but it is eerie. Let's talk about the points of departure, which you and I were chatting a little bit about before the show started. Um, there is a relationship between the community that the attackers, or alleged attackers, came from in France that is different than the relationship that the Sarnaya family had with American culture. Talk a bit about that. Well, today on The World, we spoke with a, a, a journalist from the Observer newspaper in London, and he, he made the interesting point that uh, in the UK, for example, when you talk about political Islam, uh, it feels like the United States is five years behind uh, the UK. In most cases, the US is five years, as he said, ahead of the UK. But, you know, a lot of this has to do with... And does that apply to France as well? It applies to France as well. A lot of this has to do with, with the colonial history of the UK and France. Um, they're, uh, they're positioning themselves in West Africa, in North Africa, places like Algeria. And now... Which this, is where the, uh, the alleged... That's uh, where the alleged... Are, 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 right, were from the originally. Their family was from right, originally. Right, exactly. Uh, these two guys, uh, apparently born in Paris um, and uh, grew up there. So it's just like first generation coming to, to coming of age in, in this new world um, and disenfranchisement um, and uh, what they do with their lives. There is also an interesting connection. Uh, they're looking into whether one of the brothers, I think the, the, the younger of the two brothers, uh, spent some time in Iraq or at least was motivated to go to Iraq and fight for some group of extremists. So it, it's a big world. France has the uh, largest Muslim community in Europe. 
Uh, how many how many Muslims live in France, roughly? Uh, I, I can't tell you. I don't know that number. I remember, we spoke with a reporter yesterday who said it was about 10 percent of the population. Uh, that sounds possible. Plausible, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, so uh, it, it's a world that, that, you know, the last time I went to Paris, it was 2005 to report. Um, it was right after the, uh, the riots uh, that kind of really shook the, the banlieue, the suburbs. Um, I went in those suburbs. And uh, you really do feel a sense of disconnectedness of, of these people. And I'm not saying by any means that the people who live in the suburbs are, you know, uh, are extremists. They're not. It's a very small group of people who, you know, stage these events like we saw yesterday. But there's but dissatisfaction that's there's there to be maximized. There's a lot of dissatisfaction. Uh, they, they feel like they haven't had the same chances that the old French have had in getting ahead. And, uh, and they're stuck out there in some pretty miserable housing projects. Hmm. What is your take on the sort of different ways that, as a community, Parisians have responded to this event and Bostonians responded to the marathon bombings? Well, I, I believe you spoke with Laure Mandeville uh, yesterday from uh, Le Figaro newspaper. And we spoke with her as well. And she had some really interesting things to say about that. Um, First of all, she felt that America, and she, you know, is now covering the Boston uh, Marathon bombing tribal, trial, but she felt that it, Boston especially was very resilient in coming back from what happened. And, and her take is that America is resilient because it's able to kind of carefully formulate its messages to, uh, the public is able to formulate messages to each other. Um, our values are strong. We know how to come back from something like this. We are resilient. You know, the fact that they were printing up t-shirts that said Boston yeah, almost strong. almost immediately. Almost immediately. That kind of speaks to that, whereas... And also and, I think of, you know, David Ortiz's speech at Fenway Park, which I can't repeat here on air, but this is our bleeping city. Right, absolutely. It, it's a kind of communal kind of... Uh, awakening and standing up and kind of we're here we're strong we're so is it different in Paris because I've seen images of these vigils with people standing silently holding pens or pencils high in the air it, different feel it, different feel according to law and I, I you know from what I know about Paris and the French uh, you know Fran the French are very self-critical it's an older country obviously uh, uh, and the, the, there's a sense of like maybe we're not so proud of ourselves because we're so judgmental about ourselves um, and perhaps more problems speaking out about how proud we are of our country. But I think, you know, what we're seeing now in, in, in France, all across France, with many vigils and many demonstrations, is uh, perhaps a, a change to that. Um, I guess what all this means is that a debate that was kind of on low simmer about how to deal with this new France, about how to deal with this new Europe, uh, really needs to get ratcheted up to the next level. Seems like this will do it. Marco yeah. Orman, thank you. For You're very here. welcome, Appreciate Adam. it.